This morning I want to share with you a story about God's healing. Healing does not always mean being cured from an illness. In fact, most of the healing stories in the Gospels are about much more than cures. They are about restoring people to wholeness. This is a story about a woman whom I shall simply call Mary. Mary was dying from cancer. She was terminal in the hospital on what should have been her deathbed. But the problem was that Mary would not die. All she did was to lie there on her bed in a fetal position and complain about her unbearable pain. Pain which no amount of morphine seemed to touch. She would not eat. She would not allow the lights to be turned on. She would not allow the drapes in her room to be opened. And the doctors were stymied and frustrated at not being able to help her. Finally, one of them decided to call in hospice. And because I was the spiritual caregiver of the team that was on call that evening, I received the referral. And so I went in to see Mary. As was my practice, because I didn't know Mary, I wore my collar. Not because it has any special powers or anything like that. It is simply a symbol of the office that I bear as a pastor. And it usually opens a door and gives me permission to enter into the space of the person whom I wish to be engaged with. And I was invited into her space. As I walked into her room, I introduced myself and asked her how she was doing. And her response was about as typical as one could imagine. She looked at me and she saw the collar and she gave the right religious response. When God is ready for me, I'm ready for God. But all of her actions said otherwise. The first visit was always short. It simply was intended to establish a beginning relationship to open the door for future conversations. And so after that initial exchange and a little bit more chit chat, I left promising to return the next evening. As I left her room and walked out into the hallway of the hospital, I was greeted or accosted by her husband, a big man who said he wanted to talk to me. And he invited me outside to his pickup truck where we could have a private conversation. Once I was seated in the cab of his truck, he proceeded to show me his gun and strongly suggested to me that he did not want any holy roller messing with his wife. I acknowledged his concern and took my leave as quickly as possible. But because I knew Mary's medical prognosis and her lack of response to the pain medication or to the doctor's efforts, and because I was the responsible person from the hospice team, even though concerned about her husband's reaction to me, I decided to continue my visits with Mary. This was a troubling case from so many different positions. There was Mary's view, the doctor's, her husband's, and mine. 
And I don't mind telling you that I struggled deeply with this one. On the way to the hospital on the third night, I was troubled about how to proceed. What could I possibly say to her that would make any difference? How could I possibly bring her God's peace? It, wasn't, it was obviously not a question of whether she was going to live or die. The only real question about Mary was how she would die. Whether it would be a comfortable death that wrapped up and completed her life, secure in her faith and in the love of God, as we in this community witnessed and celebrated two such passings this last week with Donna and Greg, or whether it would be a painful death, full of agony, aloneness, pain, and suffering. And in the midst of my struggles and my prayer on the way to the hospital, an answer came. And when I walked into Mary's room that evening, I asked her, what are you afraid of, Mary? <laughs> and I assured her that even though she was a strong person of faith, it was still okay to be afraid. That fear was not a sign of weakness or lack of faith, but it was a normal part of life. It's okay to be afraid, Mary. What are you afraid of? And she looked at me and the tears started rolling down her cheeks. And she began to explain to me that her husband was an alcoholic. And that he had been sober for the last 10 years of their life together. And that she was afraid that when she died, he would start drinking again. And so it was out of this deep concern for her husband that she literally refused to die. And as the conversation continued between us, I asked her if she had been able to share any of that concern or that fear with her husband. She looked at me and she shook her head and said no. She found it impossible to talk to him about her dying, let alone her fear that he would start drinking when that occurred. I told Mary that no one could promise her and no one could guarantee her that he would not start to drink again. But I shared with her that I believed that the best hope that that would not happen, the best gift that she could possibly give to her husband was the knowledge of her concern and fear that it being delivered to him and shared with him would be the the crutch, the tool, the, the support that he would need to not return to drinking. And I acknowledge how difficult it is to have that conversation, to talk about one's impending death, and so I offered to be a broker of that dialogue between the two of them. And she agreed. And I called the husband and invited him to meet me at the hospital the next evening. And I met him and we walked into the room and I began the conversation between the two of them. And talked about the fact that she was dying. But that she had this great concern. And I shared with her husband what that concern was and then I excused myself from the room to let their relationship continue the conversation from that point forward and I 
the way home. The next morning, about 6 o'clock in the morning, I got a telephone call from Mary's doctor. What did you do to that woman? She died this morning. But I want to tell you that before she died, she stopped complaining about the constant pain. She refused to take any more morphine. She uncurled and relaxed her body from that fetal <coughs> position. She asked that the lights to her room be turned on and that the window curtains be opened. And she ate what for her would be described as a good breakfast. And she died. She died what can only be described as a good death. But you see, Mary was healed. She was not cured of her cancer, which took her life. But she was healed from the illness and the pain that had racked her soul and caused her to be in bondage and not be able to release and to complete her life's journey and enter into the eternal presence of God. When we could give voice to that fear, when we could name that impediment to the life process that she needed to continue with, we began to deal with it. And once again, Mary discovered that God is a God of love. And that God only desires our wholeness and our well-being. And that God invites us to release anything and everything that blocks that embrace of pure love and compassion. And when she was able to bring that the four and give voice to the fear. God was able to unlock it and use it and grant her healing and a good death. This morning, while many of us have many physical issues and pains that we would love to turn over to God and be cured from. I invite you to consider the deeper issues about what separates you from the love of God and, and pray that God would heal you from them and bring you to the abundant life that he so desires for all of us on earth. I invite you to think in terms of what, what blocks you from picking up your cross and following Jesus, what stops you from loving all of humanity and offering your life for the sake of the world, becoming the servant of all, as Christ bids us to do? What is it that needs completion in your life that in turning it over to God, God can work His miracle of grace and healing and grant us hopes.